Hello, this is David Bergantino, author of the Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror series. You're listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian's audiobook presentation of Help Wanted. Keep it scary. <laughs> Red right hand You'll see him in your nightmares You'll see him in your dreams He'll appear out of nowhere But he's not what he seems You'll see him in your head And on the TV screen Hey buddy, I'm warning you to turn it off He's a ghost, he's a god He's a man, he's a guru Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror, Help Wanted, by David Bergantino. Chapter 12 Correction. Summer did not die immediately with Allison Heath. Instead, Allison's murder was but one spasm in the ultimate painful death of the season. Rain's murder was another, even more violent spasm. Laura unfolded the front page of the newspaper she retrieved from the front porch. It blared, Help Wanted. Death found. Oh my God! Laura cried when she read Rain's name. She forgot about the weird headline and started reading, absorbing the hideous story sentence by ghastly sentence. The phone rang. Her eyes still glued to the paper. She reached for the receiver. I guess this isn't the best day for the pool, huh? Buck had seen the article as well. What? Laura said in a daze. Oh, no, it isn't. Is it? I don't know what else to do, though. I need to be around people. We'll go, then, Buck agreed and hung up. Transfixed as she read, Laura found herself listening to a dial tone before she hung up. According to the article, Rain's body, they didn't describe how she had died, was found by a fry cook around 2 a.m., when he returned to get a watch he had left behind. The police had held him as a suspect initially, but later released him. Then came the real shock. The police had found scrawled in blood on the counter above the victim, the words, Help Wanted. Laura looked back at the headline and almost fainted. The article stated that the same two words had been written on the mirror beside Allison Heath's body at the mall, but the police had succeeded in keeping it out of the papers. Now everyone knew. Laura was breathless. She ran upstairs to wake up Shelby. Shelby was as mortified as Laura when she heard the news. Sitting up in bed, Laura noticed that she looked pale. I think that cold is coming back, Shelby said when she noticed her sister studying her. I'm going to bow out on the pool thing, uh, but you should go. No use in both of us stewing in our own juices. Are you sure? Laura would stay if her sister wanted her to. Go ahead. Summer's not over yet, Shelby smiled, no matter what they say. Buck's bright beach towel and colorful swim trunks were in stark contrast to his mood as he climbed in Laura's car. It took him a few moments to notice that Shelby was missing. After Laura told him she was sick, he lapsed back into silence. You seem worse than you were this morning and you barely knew rain, Laura pointed out. Buck shifted listlessly in the passenger seat. Actually, she was the only other person who was nice to me. Laura recalled how Rain had seemed to adopt Buck at Doug's party. No wonder he was so blue. I called the hospital this morning, he said suddenly. Apparently the blood used to write those words was Warner Halbert's. You mean they still haven't found him? Laura asked. No, 
Buck said. It seems he's the prime suspect, but the police aren't saying anything to the press because they're afraid of being laughed out of town. Why? Their theory is that Holbert got out of the hospital, was brain damaged or something, and is going around killing kids responsible for the car accident. But it was his fault, Laura pointed out. He had the heart attack that caused the wreck. I know, but he's brain damaged now, or so the police think, and he writes, help wanted in his own blood because of his job. As a headhunter, Laura mused. But if that's true, then we're in trouble. Us, Shelby, Doug, and Chester, too. The scenario seemed impossible. It can't be. I'm sure the police don't really believe that. It, it's ridiculous. Laura was suddenly aware she was trying to convince herself, not Buck. She was scared. Timidly, she continued. I don't believe it. You don't, do you, Buck? Not at all, Buck answered. But the police? They're searching the Thompson house. Why there? If you were a crazed child killer, where would you hide out? By the time they arrived at the pool, Laura was convinced they were making a mistake. But at the same time, she felt like there was no turning back. As they walked across the parking lot, Laura made Buck promise to behave. If he's here, Laura said, he probably won't cause trouble because he'll be working. But I don't want you to give him any excuses, okay? I won't lift a finger, Buck promised. Unless, of course, he starts something. Laura looked him over carefully. He better not. Same goes for you, too, okay? Deal. The poolside itself held two surprises. For one, Chester was nowhere to be seen. Even more surprising was Doug's presence. She had tried calling him earlier, but his line had been busy. Now he sat slouched at the top of his lifeguard chair. Now there's your murderer, Buck said under his breath before he could stop himself. Laura looked at him sharply. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But she wasn't angry. He had just reminded her of what Doug had said last night about rain. It's all right. What makes you say that, though? I told you. I have a sense about him. That hardly makes him a murderer. True, Buck conceded. But I've been thinking about my car. Maybe it was him, not Chester. He hasn't been too friendly, and I bet it's because he sees me as a threat to his relationship with you. He waited for Laura to deny his words. She didn't. As for the murders, he continued, that cut on his finger sent up a big red flag in my brain. Laura glanced quickly over to Doug. His finger was no longer bandaged. Doug saw her looking. His eyes were dead. Laura turned away. I saw it too, she told Buck. Let's just say I'm surprised the police haven't tested his blood yet. Laura could say nothing, but she was thinking the same thing. Then her thoughts were abruptly interrupted as Buck suddenly was jolted away toward the pool. He landed with a painful belly flop. Out of breath, he thrashed about in the water. Laura glared at Chester, who stood at the pool's edge, smug and laughing. Sorry about that, Chester called to Buck. I guess I tripped and got thrown really off balance. I didn't mean to knock into you. He leaned over and reached for Buck's hand. Chester, don't! He ignored her. Give me your hand. Chester reached out farther and missed Buck's flailing hand. Instead, he found Buck's head and pushed him down under the surface of the pool. Oops! He cried facetiously and reached out again and dunked Buck again. Laura took hold of Chester's arm and tried to haul him away from the water's edge, but it was like trying to budge a boulder. Stop it! She yelled. After one last dunk, Chester stood up. I was just trying to help, he said with an evil grin on his face. Buck finally found the edge of the pool and pulled himself to it. Holding himself up on his arms, Buck clung to the side, his breath heaving. You nearly drowned him, Laura cried and tried to help Buck out of the water. 
If I wanted to drown him, I would have, Chester hissed. Looking at Buck, he practically spat. You came to the wrong place today, buddy. Coming here was like walking into the lion's den, smeared with bacon fat. Buck still hadn't recovered enough to reply. Satisfied, Chester disappeared into the pole administration building. That's it, Laura said, looking after him. I'm going to get him fired. He can't do that. No, <coughs> no, Buck choked out finally. Let me take care of it. Anger seeped from him like dense fog. I've taken enough of his shit. Laura didn't even try to contradict him this time. For once, she felt that however Buck decided to handle this was his business. Chester deserved to be put in his place once and for all. Let's go, Buck said. As they left, Laura caught a glimpse of Doug. His eyes seemed to register blank. If he had seen the altercation with Chester, he gave no sign of it. He looked like a zombie. Laura and Buck decided to scuttle the rest of the day. Chester had ruined whatever good time they might have been able to have. When Laura dropped Buck off at home, she called him back to the car before he went inside. He leaned in the driver's side window, much like he had clung to the side of the pool. What's up? he asked, his mood only slightly lighter than since they'd left the pool. Laura hemmed and hawed, but finally spoke. There's something I never told you about the night we went to the movie. What? A dark cloud seemed to hover over Buck. I found a ring under the car that night. Chester's class ring. I even called him and he admitted that he had messed up your tires. She paused. Buck waited for her to go on. Anyway, he even dared me to tell you, but I didn't. And now I'm sorry. Why didn't you tell me? He asked carefully. Because I didn't want there to be trouble. Trouble was exactly what Chester wanted. Now, she admitted, I just don't care, least of all about Chester. Laura braced herself for Buck's anger. Instead, he relaxed. Oh, well, that's okay. Doug or Chester? No one for sure doesn't make that much of a difference to me, actually. So, are you mad at me? I guess I should be, he said. But I'm not. Lucky you. Yeah, I feel lucky she said, smiling. Buck managed a smile of his own, but it seemed labored. Let's try again tomorrow, okay? Not the pool, right? Not the pool, he echoed. I wouldn't be caught dead there. The rest of the day seemed to last forever. Shelby was still feeling poorly and napped on and off during the day. Laura realized suddenly that she had no one to talk to. When the sun finally set, Laura anxiously awaited sleep. She wanted to escape today and hope for a better tomorrow. How pathetic, Laura thought. I'm acting like all I want is a day without tragedy. Could things get any worse? Laura shuddered. Lately, that seemed to be the wrong question to ask. At midnight, large hands appeared on the top of the stone wall that surrounded much of the pool. Muscles flexed. Chester's muscles. He gave himself three pull-up reps before lifting himself to the top of the wall and over. Quit flexing and pull me up, said Chester's female companion on the other side of the wall. Obliging, not because he was obliging by nature, but because he was finished flexing, Chester lifted his date over the wall. 
She giggled to have his arms around her. She was so much smaller than he was. She was like a feather by comparison. Soon she was standing beside him. Shelby Walcott looked around the dark, empty pool area. A thrill rushed up her spine. You have a key. Why didn't we come in the front door? She asked. Chester laughed as if she were a clever little child, threw his arm around her, and they began to walk toward the pool building, which loomed like a large blank spot before them. Because, silly, anybody can come through the front door during regular hours. Coming over the wall is more exciting. I guess, Shelby told him, but she seemed playfully unconvinced. She giggled again. Did you ever bring Laura here at night? She asked. Nope. She's a little straight-laced for pool hopping. I bet, Shelby said in a voice Laura would not recognize. It was more adult and more harsh. She'd be really upset if she knew I was here now. Ooh, who cares about her? Chester purred. Girls liked it when he purred. Shelby was different, though. At his comment, she whirled in his arms. I do, she said sharply. I don't want her to get hurt which is why she can't know what's going on. Chester recoiled slightly, then Shelby wrapped his arms around her waist, again like he was a sweater. That doesn't mean I don't want to have fun, she purred even more effectively than he had. I can't believe how boring I've been my whole life. Personally, Chester said, lifting her up off her feet, I think you're cured. Shelby shrieked and covered her mouth out of embarrassment. Ready for a swim? Chester asked. Not yet, Shelby told him. You go ahead, though. Chester instantly stripped to the swim trunks he had worn under his cutoffs. In the dim light of the stars and the crescent moon, Chester could barely see Shelby. Too bad, he thought. That means she can barely see me. Her loss. Slipping easily into the water, none of this toe-testing malarkey for him, Chester swam quickly to the deep end of the pool. The question of his future came to mind. Would it be sports, acting? Actually, modeling appealed to him. It seemed to be the easiest money for the least effort. Just stand there and look beautiful. He could handle that. In the middle of his second lap, Chester remembered Shelby. More accurately, he remembered he was with someone and Shelby's name came to mind a few seconds later. He often became distracted when he got to thinking about himself. No one else existed. He swam to the edge of the pool. Hey, you coming in or what? He whispered hoarsely to Shelby, who sat on the concrete nearby watching him swim. With his left hand, he splashed some water in her direction. She scooted back, giggling. Stop that, I'll be in. Okay, just don't make me wait too long. Chester told her as he fell backward into the water again and resumed swimming laps. Normally, he wouldn't even care if the girl he was with joined him. He was happy to give his date something to watch. But Shelby was a special case. He wanted to get his revenge on Laura for dumping him. Chester suspected that when Laura found out he had been seeing Shelby on the sly, there would be big fireworks. Fireworks between him and Laura. And big, big fireworks between Laura and Shelby. Shelby, in her naivety and eagerness to turn over a new leaf, didn't realize what she was doing, which was just how Chester liked it. He knew that Doug had already tried and failed to inform Laura about what was going on. It was her utter disbelief that proved to Chester how effective his revenge would be. Even the painted message in the street, which he initially thought would give away the game too soon, had worked in his favor. Buck, that wacko, was no doubt behind that. Doug would never pull such a stunt. Even Chester knew that. And if Laura was thinking clearly, she would realize that as well. No, it had to have been Buck. That's why he'd gone easy on Buck today at the pool. He had planned worse, but the guy had unknowingly helped him out. So Chester had felt charitable, but he felt no such charity toward Laura. He was almost ready to pull out his trump card, Shelby. So far, they had been very careful to conceal their activities, but Shelby was acting so giddy now at the excitement of it all, she wouldn't notice if Chester arranged a small slip, a slip that would reveal their relationship to Laura. 
As soon as Shelby dipped even one toe in the water, that would be the sign. Come on, he called out suddenly from the middle of the pool. I'm lonely in here. He looked out toward the black blot of the administration building. Shelby had been sitting there only minutes ago. Now she was gone. Chester swam to the edge of the pool. He called out scanning the entire pool area. His eyes had by now adjusted to the darkness, but Shelby was nowhere in sight. Hey, Shell! He shouted using his full voice. No response. Come on, I'm not in the mood for this. He used the voice that usually brought an end to nonsense. Still, Shelby did not appear, nor did she giggle to indicate he should come find her. That would have been all right by Chester, but nothing. The only sounds were the gentle slosh of the water against the sides of the pool, a soft wind, and street sounds from the city beyond the concrete walls. Suddenly, Chester was worried, not for Shelby's safety, but what would happen to him if something had happened to her? Now that would be the monkeyest of wrenches in his plans. He started to pull himself out of the pool. That was when a dark shape detached itself from the administration building and moved toward him. Chester didn't see anything until it was almost upon him. By then, it was too late. Two strong hands clamped onto Chester's shoulders and pushed him firmly backward. Instinctively, Chester used his legs to shove himself out and away from the attacker. But the grip on his shoulders was too strong. The hands did not let go. The attacker wasn't even pulled into the water. Chester only succeeded in pulling muscles in both his legs. The next moment, Chester's head was underwater. He struggled and thrashed, but to no avail. The arms that held him down were solid as granite and just as impervious to his blows. And unlike earlier when he had dunked Buck, Chester was not being allowed back up to the surface. Finally, it dawned on Chester that he was about to drown. Impossible, his mind shouted. I have a life of beaches, babes, and bodybuilding to live. Standing around looking good and getting paid for it. It was the American dream. Where'd this nightmare come from? All these thoughts and more swam upstream desperately against an increasingly strong current of despair. Then the pain began. His chest was clenched in a vice as strong as the hands on his shoulders. These were his lungs crying out for air and his diaphragm contracting to force him to breathe. Chester felt like a tube of toothpaste being squeezed from the bottom. But it wasn't toothpaste that oozed out of him. It was his life. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 12 of Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror, Help Wanted by David Bergantino. This was a kind of a short upload because the final upload, which will be the next one, is going to be the final chapters, and it's going to be about the normal length. If I had made this a two-chapter upload, then the final upload would have only been like eight minutes or something. And, uh, you know, I wanted the last upload to really have a lot of the uh, in-game story there. Um, but as far as this chapter goes, we have a new death to talk about. And my suspect is at the scene of the crime, Shelby. Uh, she, the whole getting sick thing, feeling better all of a sudden, talking in a voice that even Laura wouldn't recognize, all that stuff, and then Chester dying after she disappears from the pool, reaffirms that I think Shelby's the killer. But if Shelby didn't kill Chester, then maybe it was Buck. Not that Buck's possessed by Freddy. I still do not believe that Buck is the one possessed by Freddy. But I do think he's capable of killing someone. And after what Chester did and finding out Chester was the one that did that to his tires whenever they went to the movie, 
I can see Buck actually killing Chester. Maybe uh, locking Shelby in a in the administration building so she couldn't, you know, see what happened or whatever. And then he get, went out there and killed Chester. Because uh, either that or just Freddie, you know, taking over Shelby's body made her, like, a lot stronger and stuff. Which is obvious that that happens when he's possessing someone. But the book said, like, the arms were like granite. And Buck was in really good shape. So... I'm guessing Buck may have killed Chester, but he's not possessed. the one possessed by Freddy. Either that or Shelby did it. Uh, still, there's no one else that I think is a killer besides Shelby as far as who's possessed by Freddy. I don't think it's the Halbert guy. That's just too... The fact that his blood's being used lets me know that he's already dead. Uh, it would be too on the nose if he's the killer. But, I mean, that could happen. I'm just guessing it's Shelby because of her, you know, getting sick and all of a sudden she's out doing stuff late at night... Um, and the way she was acting there, uh, you know, like talking with that voice that Laura wouldn't recognize. Uh, the whole thing with Chester, you know, attacking Buck at the pool, I'm really surprised Buck didn't snap and just kill him right there in front of everybody, as, as unstable as Buck seems. Um, but yeah, I think that gave him a really good motive to, uh, kill, to kill Chester. Uh, and without being possessed, I think Buck's capable of killing I would not be surprised if we found out that Shelby is the one possessed by Freddy that's killed like Rain and Allison and whoever dies next. And But she didn't get to kill like she had planned on killing Chester, but Buck beat her to it. That would be a cool twist because Buck is a psycho. He seems like a psycho. Uh, but moving forward, it's, I'm excited to get to the conclusion because uh, Laura's already suspicious of Buck. Uh, she's kind of like, warmed back up to him a little bit, but after Chester dies, after their altercation at the pool, I can kind of see that uh, she's going to think he's the killer. So I kind of predict there being like this thing where she's jumping on Buck, accusing him of being the killer, then maybe Shelby walks in and reveals it was her all along or something. I don't know. I really think it's Shelby. For a second there, I thought it could be Doug because the book talked about him, um, his eyes being dead, and he looked like a zombie sitting on the lifeguard chair. And that, I'm sorry, David, but I know your tricks by this point, and that's a red herring. I, I just have a feeling that's a red herring. You're trying to throw me off and make me think Doug's the one possessed, but no. I'm going all in on Shelby. I've got a gut feeling I have not read forward. I will not read forward. We're going to all find out together in the conclusion upload, which will be out in the next couple days or so, the conclusion of Help Wanted. We're going to find out who it was all along. My vote is Shelby. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Do you think it's Shelby? Do you think it's Buck? Do you think it's Doug? Could it be Laura? You know, who knows, right? And uh, do you also, if, it, if it's not Buck, do you think Buck still was capable of killing Chester? You know, and do you think the whole thing with Doug was red herring like I think it was? Either way, this has been a really entertaining book. Great story. Thank you, David, for writing yet another awesome Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror book. God, I wish you'd written 20 of these. I, I would read them all on the channel. This has been a blast. Uh, it's really sad that this is the last one that you've written. Um, but I look forward to talking about these on um, Out of Print Slashers podcast. And I look forward to the conclusion of Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror, Help Wanted, which I'll be dropping on the channel between now and Monday night. So I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, pleasant dreams, and uh, wait 30 minutes after you eat before you go swimming. Have a good night. And if you've got a little extra time, check out uh, the show Slash Tracks on the channel here. It's like Mystery Science Theater 3000 with a horror twist. Um... We've done, we, we do complete movie riff commentaries. Uh, starting with episode six, we really embrace the whole mystery science theater aspect. We have a masked villain on the show named Master Evil. He's the one forcing me and my co-host Alex Van over to watch these bad movies. Um, sometimes we include the entire movie with the episode. Sometimes uh, we just, if we can't include the movie due to copyright reasons, we let you guys know when to hit play on your copy of the movie. So you're queued up with our riff commentary. It's very funny. All comedy once we get to the riffing. 
and it's a lot of fun. The movies are always bad, and uh, we we have a lot of fun with them, and I think you will too. Uh, if you do watch an episode that doesn't have the movie included, check the description, because I will include a link to either the movie, where you can watch it for free, uh, along with our com- and then you can queue up with our commentary, or I will include a link to where you can watch a version of the episode with the movie included with our commentary all in one video uh, on Google Drive. Uh, that way you can see the whole thing without it affecting the YouTube copyright things. Uh, hope you guys enjoy it. I would love your feedback on the show. Uh, like I said, episode 6 is where we really hit our stride and the show became what it is now and what it's going to remain. Uh, before that, we did uh, a couple kind of serious, half-serious, half-comedy review uh, riffs, riff commentaries for Jason X and Freddy's, uh, Freddy's Dead, and we followed that up with riff commentaries to uh, Ghoulies, Ghostbusters 2016, and Troll 2, uh, but those, uh, those had the, you know, we did the whole riff commentary thing and let you know when to hit play on your copy, but starting with episode 6, we had the whole wraparound segments at the beginning and end of the show uh, with Master Evil and him letting us know we're watching that night. Then the riffing happens with the whole movie, if it's, you know, if we can include it. And then it ends with Master Evil letting us know what's coming the next time, stuff like that. Lots of fun on these little comedy bits, and I think you'll enjoy the show if you'll give it a chance. Uh, Episodes 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 are all available on the channel. And uh, check them out. Episode 11 is coming out in just a few days. And uh, I'm going to end the upload here with the intro, the animated intro and theme song for Slash Tracks. To give you an idea of the, you know, the vibe and humor of the show. I'd appreciate if you check it out. Hit the playlist section up here on the channel. Uh, there's a playlist for all the episodes of Slash Tracks so far. Alright guys, see you next time. When Master Evil comes to play And Mama says that it's okay Alex and Josh are stole away and made to watch these movies to stay alive until the day they